One of the ways is, and I did this as a uni student back in the 20th century, is I built in a health and physical education course every semester. So I took tennis, I took swimming, I took running. One semester I took skiing. G'day and welcome to Wellbeing. I'm Jack Hodgins. Today we are discussing student wellbeing in universities. We are joined by John Fischetti, a professor of education from the University of Newcastle. Professor Fischetti has been in the educational field for three and a half decades and is challenging the way we see education. In this episode, we discuss the changing attitudes to well-being in universities. Hello, John, and welcome to Wellbeing. Thank you, Jack. Good morning. What is a university's role when it comes to student well-being? Well-being is a really relevant topic, isn't it? It's even become more so, Jack, in the last few years. I think in many ways, no one's been the best version of themselves. And that starts with how we're going. And as you probably know, there's at least three types of well-being. There's the physical and emotional, and then there's sort of the spiritual. And a lot of people don't claim that space, but it really is how we relate to country, how we relate to the, the world around us, and, and how we feel kind of in our bones. So I think there's those three kinds. And of course, a universal experience taps all three. The number one aspect of well-being is people feeling like they can be themselves in the educational environment. You know, you're a student yourself and, you know, the very first day of coming to university is intimidating. Uh, what do you wear and who you see and how you behave? And so people almost put on the jumper that's not necessarily them. They put on their student jumper. And one of the reasons that school uniforms are interesting is typically uniforms create uniformity, but I'm not sure that's what we're looking for at university. We want you to be you and figure out the next you you're trying to be. So I think the first role of university is providing a safe place where people feel they can be themselves so they don't have to pretend, because once you pretend in any relationship with a puppy, a partner, or the world, it always comes back to haunt you because you're, mm. you're sort of faking it. So I think that's the number one job is to provide a space people can explore the mind, take in new ideas and feel that they can be themselves in doing that. Have you seen students doing a bit better, say, since we've gotten back from lockdowns and those kind of the pandemic kind of related things? Probably one of the most refreshing components of at least our university experience is how much students want to be together with each other and their lecturers to make sure that this is a learning environment, a community of learning. There's so much information in so many ways that we can do things online. Uh, we can listen to podcasts, we can do our banking, uh, we can get the best lectures in the world from MIT to Harvard to Oxford for free on MOOCs on our phones. But there's something special about learning together. Mm. And in that sense, it's been really refreshing. And particularly the most vulnerable, those that actually need the extra supports, they need to ask that question in person to kind of feel the answer. Like I'm looking at you now, it's so much better than if we were on Zoom, actually. I mean, even though we know each other on Zoom for a couple of years, I just think it's a real environment that actually allows us to have that human learning, which I think are those other aspects, that spiritual well-being, whether we want to call it that or not, that we're humans going through this experience together. This is our precious, pre precious present right near Jack, you and me together doing this. Uh, recording. And I think that part of things is really fun. Can we learn in a community together? I know because students take multiple classes and they're almost all working or supporting their families in one way or the other, taking care of their granny, taking care of their, their child, or working double shifts because there's a shortage of staff wherever they might work. That, that aspect of, of the difficulty can then lead to um, being overwhelmed. And I think that part means we've got to figure out how to help our students find that right balance, that school life balance that might be the same as work life balance. We kind of touched on the, the three different types of well-being there, John, the physical, the mental and the spiritual. Are there any specific topics within, within those three things that universities are really focusing on at the moment? I think because universities are a choose-your-own-adventure, it really is a two-way street between the university providing it and students taking advantage of it. And I think some of it is surrounding yourself as a student with people who build you up and make you better. Uh, I tell kids this all the time as a former teacher and a current university teacher, the most important decision you make in your life and the first one you get to make by yourself is who your friends are. Early days, your carers make every decision for you, what you eat, what you wear, where you go, when you sleep, and we're just told what to do. And many times schools mirror that for you. You're going to do math at nine. Sorry if you're not awake yet. Uh, so in the, the telling part, choosing your friends is so crucial. So surrounding yourself with people who are also committed to finding that balance. You might have sat next to someone who's going for that HD. They've got to be the best. Well, that's great. I'd like to get to know them. But at what cost? Their health um, and, or someone who doesn't really show up and they say, well, 
why bother? Or they are uh, partying on Tuesday night, calling it have a nice weekend. That might just be a little early to call it the weekend, Jack. So finding those folks that build you up and make you better is so crucial in in making those decisions. Uh, One of the ways is, and I did this as a uni student now back in the 20th century, I built in a health and physical education course every semester. So I took tennis, I took swimming, I took running. One semester I took skiing in the winter term and went on excursions on the weekend, an intense course. I put myself out to make sure I'd built in that physical movement. And if you don't formally do that, I'd like to see in your diary yourself, where have you built in biking or running or Mm -hmm. jogging or yoga? or walking, whatever works for you. If you don't, the wear and tear of the cognitive load affects what you're able to do to stay who you are and stay fresh and healthy and positive. Because this is about opening doors, right? Getting a uni experience or any kind of educational experience is keeping doors open or opening new ones so you can have a great life. When it stops feeling that way, we almost think of it as a burden rather than a privilege. So I think one of the steps is finding in your daily schedule, your weekly schedule, and then I built it in for course credit. It was not graded, but boy, Boy, that was great. I met different people, had some fun. And Tuesday night, gosh, I had to go bowling. <laughs> it was good. <laughs> Sounds good. Sounds good. Have you found that students have, are getting enough movement in their day? Many are not. Uh, some are obviously elite athletes or practicing or on their teams or, you know, playing uh, rugby union or, or netball on, as part of their hobbies. But it tends to be the first thing that goes along with mm. healthy diet. And when you're not moving that 10,000 steps a day and you're not eating well or you're double dosing on uh, the caffeine, caffeinated drinks, um, then you're losing sleep. What happens really is um, this concept of stress. And you may be going there in a minute, so I'll hold off answering that one. Are there any kind of we've spoken we've, well we've spoken about some of the things that are kind of affecting students? Are there services that unis have available to assist them? There's a number of services, and they start probably in the core of what we're here to do, which we call courses, right? The the ten or twelve week experience that people are in when they are going through with someone who's leading that. They might be a professor, or a lecturer, or a tutor. In that, there are supports around that that start with them. And it starts by asking questions, not waiting till the end and going, oh, I'm confused. What if you're right in the middle of a lecture or a tutorial and they say any questions? Or you go visit them and or send a note and say, can we meet and discuss or have an online exchange or a Zoom meeting? Answering questions now doesn't lead to confusion later and stress later, particularly as assessments pile up at the end of terms. So ask good questions. You're a good question asker. Ask questions. Can you re-explain that? Or form a little study group with a couple of people mm-hmm. who seem earnest and doesn't have to be virtual. You can you know, do it on whatever version of the chat functions people are using. It might have changed yesterday and I don't have the right information. Um, so I think that's the starting point. Then it's the university has support systems in, in tutorial support, uh, mentoring and peer support. And then of course, there's for anybody not going well at all, there's counseling and advice for people who are just saying, I'm, I'm losing it and to intervene early on that. And also to have a, a mate who will call it out. Hey, Jack, you're not having a good week. You're all right. So it's almost that are you okay without it seeming trite all the time. Mm-hmm. We can do it for ourselves, but usually when we need that the most, uh, we're not our best own yeah. critics. So yeah. the university has major supports. A lot of times students are either A, afraid to ask questions, B, afraid to go get support. They're paying for it. You're paying for that mm-hmm. support. And I think it's okay to say, I need a little help. If you wait till the end, then you don't do well. Then that starts to pile up, which increases the stress you had anyway. And feel like you're not a deficit, that having a question is actually what probably science number one is about inquiry. Mm. So you hope you have questions. I might have said something wrong or confusing, or it might have sparked a different idea, or you just might understand it the way I explained it. Assume that because you have a question, that's not a problem. It's a good thing. You're listening to Wellbeing a nationally distributed radio show and podcast. My guest today is Professor John Fischetti, where we are discussing student well-being in universities. Have you found that students really take on those services or do they sometimes are a bit anxious to take it on or they, they don't take on those, those well-being services such as the counselling? Our students are so busy, many of them working a huge number of hours, managing a lot in their families or in their personal lives, really mature, making really good choices. But quite often you see uni as like a part-time gig uh, as opposed to a full-time investment for which the other things should be part-time if you can make them. Really hard to do it. So if you have enough time, going over and seeking that advice sounds easy. If you don't, because you're rushing to work or picking up your kids from school or you're going to your job at the community radio station, you just may feel like you do not have the opportunity to do so. Uh, 
I think those are excuses because we just don't want to admit. And in any 12-step process, the first step is to say, I'm John, hi, I'm John, I'm confused, or I'm stressed, or I need support. And admitting that to yourself. Obviously, those going well that take advantage of those supports are seeking it out, but they're there for them. And some of those are now online. For example, this sounds different than the topic you're proposing. Our library has online Q&A with reference librarians. If you're working on an assignment at eight in the evening and going, God, I'm going to be here all night. Why don't you get in touch with the reference librarian and one click or one you know, chat on the bot, you can probably get an answer that'll say, oh, that just saved me two hours. Yeah. So it doesn't have to be I'm falling over and I yeah, need some yeah. meds. It could just be, I don't know how to solve this. I don't know how to do this. It's hard. And that's okay. It's supposed to be hard. If it was easy, you wouldn't need to do all of this. That's so right. I think reaching out for support at the littlest thing means it doesn't become the big thing. I also have a real moral obligation to recommend that nobody is really doing much of anything well about 2 a.m. Um, and some students like pull that all night or still, or they don't really start on their uni work till 11 or midnight. I've not seen anybody's best work happen then. You feel busy, you might be hyped up, you might be stressed, and you might feel like I'm working. But what I'd rather do is we flipped it. If you're going to be, you know, with friends and socializing from six to 10 and then working on your uni work from 10 to one, flip it around. Do your uni work from six to 10 and be socialized from 10 to one till you pass out. It's flip it around because then you're going to get more productive. You're going to do better. And when you pass out, you'll wake up and be able to do your thing without it being like, I didn't really get my best work in. So I think it's really important just to take charge of your timetable, not feel like it comes to you. Obviously, our best students know how to do that. But quite often, they're so eaten up in their motivation to do really well that they're also not happy. They're, they're doing well, but not happy, which is, I think, what we've got to do, particularly in, I don't call it back to normal, Jack, it's forward to normal. As we go forward to create a new normal, I think we got to bring the joy back into the privilege it is to be in a free country where we get to choose our own destiny as you are. Would you say that then a lot of students put a lot of pressure on themselves, unneeded pressure? I think some of that pressure is because people want to do well, and that's how excellence happens. Any elite musician or athlete or scientist has always put pressure because they want to come up with the next idea. They want to be the best. But we also have to be human, and we don't want to sacrifice our relationships, and we don't want to sacrifice our health. So more ideas come to me on my Sunday run up the Bar Beach Hill here in Newcastle, which, if you don't know, goes from sort of the Cooks Hill Surf Club, a kilometer sort of up toward the... A memorial walk. And then around, I go up and down the hills. And during those runs, I try to divert my attention from the fact this is really stupid to run up this hill uh, to thinking about a problem I want to solve for the mm -hmm. week. And one always, a solution always comes to me, partly because my brain does not want to focus on you're really an idiot to be running up this hill. But if you're not moving and you're not thinking, remember, most of the creativity happens offline. Um, during the last big bout of the plague in particularly the UK, but around Europe, where about 30% of the population died, Isaac Newton was forced from his uh, position as a, as a lecturer to work from home for a few months because everybody was dying. <laughs> and it's in that working from home and reflecting that he went out in his orchard and a lot of the mathematical and scientific principles we call gravity and other things, when an apple fell on his head, well, he was actually in an apple orchard thinking about stuff. He went back to uni a few months later and became a professor for all the ideas he came up with, diverting and enjoying nature and being outside and not being in the rigors all the time. So finding that moment to breathe when you're really trying to reckon with something difficult, going off task is often the best thing to do. So overthinking it can actually lead to just more wear and tear and more stress. Are there any signs that you can see in students that kind of tell you that they might be struggling? Well, you, you should know them in yourself. Uh, it usually starts with excuses. When you start coming up with the excuses, I, you know, I slept late or the traffic or I didn't get around to it or I'm confused. The unconfused could be confusion or it just could mean you didn't actually read the assignment because our students today have a difficult time with long reading because so much we do is watching. So you just got to chunk out that reading into bits like, like might be an episode of a series <laughs> rather than a, a cinematic movie, right? Take mm -hmm. the first 30 pages, not the 300 that are due and chunk it out and then take some notes around it. So I think that's it. The other is that that um, you've got to have the indicators around you that tell you that's not happening. And people who you trust will just say, hey, you're okay. Again, I mentioned that just a little earlier. So I think students have a difficult time owning up to the fact um, that it's stressful. I've been in university education now for 40 years, mm. right? Think of, think of that, right? Um, that's a lot of semesters. Yep. Yep. So I can see the end of this one and the next one in my head because I've been down the river before. 
I, I haven't been with you or the class I'm in or the PhD student I'm supervising. So each time it's a pleasure because it's a different journey. We might go a little left or a little right, or we might go straight over the waterfall. Who knows? In in that journey, I find that particularly right now, weeks four and weeks 10 of the academic semesters that we use, I know some of our listeners will be on different timetables, but just about the time the first big assessment task is due and we're getting toward the end, I can feel the difference in how students are going. It, you can feel it in the car park. You can feel it online because they have multiple things due and it's just annoying. And some of that's because of the way we teach might still be doing traditional assessments that really aren't authentic. When most people are doing well, it's because what they've chosen to do in the assessment matches. What if this was your final exam for a communications course, yeah. Jay? Produce a podcast and launch it, right? And be good. evaluated on how you ask questions or how you got John to be quiet, whatever it is that they're judging you on. That feels like something you'd be nervous about, but not really worried about because yeah. it's what you're doing here, right? And if it didn't go well, we'd get the chance to do it again. Mm. We don't have to put this on air. So many of the exams still feel like your grandmother's exams, written exams, yep. yep. 2,000 word essays, things that seem maybe there's one of these you do in your uni career, but do I have to do three a semester? So some of it's on us to change change assessment. And some of it's on planning ahead and seeing that actually all along we're getting ready for that. And at the end, it should be okay. But I think a lot of it is we're still, we at our end may be doing assessment in 20th century, 19th century terms. Here we are in 2022 mm -hmm. and we're not doing it as realistic because I think the students going really well, see the application of that assessment, just say, well, sure, I got this. The other part is we don't remember anything after two weeks mm. unless we've applied it. So most of what we take in, we're not going to remember. So we cram for exams. We do okay, and then we forget. So what we have to do is have multiple ways to learn things so we can remember them later on. Otherwise, what we're going to do is just go through the motions. I have courses on my transcript from university as an undergraduate I don't even remember taking. And I've this might sound really old-fashioned. I've never done illegal drugs. I don't. So it's not like I was out of it. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> I don't even remember. I took a sociology class once. I looked, I got a, a B, which would be like, a distinction or, you know, yep, uh, yep. I don't remember. I, I remember the room. I remember I was studying, but I don't even remember what the course was. And I must have gotten something, but I don't remember it. We got to do better than that. Yep, and so it's yep. a student's job to bring meaning, but it's the lecturer's job to make it engaging. So we've got to meet halfway and I think join that student experience uh, together with what we're intending for students to learn and why we even need universities, which is really to promote knowledge to improve the planet together. You mentioned that you've had 40 years in this field, John. How do you deal with when there's when a student comes to you with a really confronting issue? How do you, how do you deal with that? Because we have new forms of communication, there used to be a, every lecturer would have an office. On Tuesdays, 10 to 12, and Thursdays, 1 to 3, they'd be in that office, and students would walk up to their door, sign a little piece of paper on the door, and come in, and you'd just, you know, vent your, your uh, issues or seek advice. There wasn't such a thing as email, or there mm -hmm. wasn't a way to text, and it wasn't ways in the, there weren't the learning platforms like Canvas or Blackboard mm -hmm. or those things. Now, most of those are coming through an email. And literally this morning in one of my classes that has more than 400 second year students in it, the number of students who need adjustments or need advice or need suggestions is extraordinary. A lot of it related to our COVID experience, just not even close to being done yet. A lot of it related to our students who are working really hard and I admire them a lot. And some of it is I just might not have explained what it is they're doing clearly enough. So that's great. It's a good question. But it seems to me we're increasing in the number of students who are needing extra supports just for little things because they're, they're just dealing with a lot. Mm -hmm. And I think it's feeling confident to ask and seek those supports because there's flexibility there to work with them to make adjustments of a few days or to re-explain something or provide another link or help them out. And I think that's what we have to do. That's our jobs is to take the ideas you're supposed to learn and make sure we be flexible enough that we can give it to you the way that works for you and not be so judgmental that only had to happen in that box, in that tutorial room. And if it didn't happen there, it wasn't learning. But I think students reaching out is the number one thing, but they are reaching out and it's, it's incredible the numbers, which I think is a healthy thing. Mm. I just wish every student would start on that path a little earlier so they didn't put themselves under stress like they're a problem. Asking a question is a good thing. Have, in, in that 40 years, have we, in, when it comes to student well-being in universities, how far have we come along? 
The good news is, all right, this was my orientation to university. I think you went to the uni orientation yes, back yep. at the beginning of this year, right? I yep. think we were talking about that yes, yes, in uh, right. February. So we, in, in the U.S., obviously where I come from, there's large basketball arenas on every university campus where the basketball teams play, the volleyball teams play, and they have big events like graduations, and they have things like orientation. So I was in a first-year class of about 3,500 first-year students, most of them school leavers, very few mature age students at that university. We got into the upper deck of that bowl in that arena. We were upstairs in sections like one, two, and three. And the provost or the vice chancellor or somebody with a fancy title was on the microphone downstairs. Now everybody hear this. Uh, I want section one to stand up. Section two, section three. Then he said, okay, section two, I want you to sit down. And I said, sections one and three, I want you to look right and look left. In four years, because the, they were four years degrees at the time, that many of you won't be here because you're going to fail. You've come to a top university, about one third of you will fare, and we're really proud of that. Mm -hmm. Very first day, I haven't had a class yet. Mm -hmm. And they're telling me that the person sitting next to me or I are probably going to fail. That was the welcome to university. If you went to the big uh, event for your program, I think it was probably much more pleasant than that. Much more pleasant. <laughs> yes, yes. Much more encouraging. Uh, so I think that's a real improvement. Definitely. And we didn't have all the supports out there for mental health and well-being. I don't think anybody really cared. Mm. I think the other aspect is we're much more progressive on gender identity. Uh, we're much more progressive on sexual orientation. We're much more uh, on diversity and welcoming. We've got a long way to go. Yes. But I think right now we're in a better place than 40 years ago, that it's okay to be you or whoever you are, yeah. whoever you love or whatever you want to do is fine. Building a community of respect, tolerance, understanding. If a university can't do that, who can? So I think that's the work we have left to do all around Australia and all around the world is building a culture of learning how to agree and disagree. Because for a democracy to thrive, it relies on disagreeing. This election to me showed Australia's okay because voters chose change. Whatever you voted for, you probably voted for some kind of change. Mm. That change, whether it's left, right, or center, has revealed itself. And this is not a political podcast, but I see that the health of the nation is good because people actually want there to be disagreement in parliament, but civil disagreement, not bullying. Mm. We've got to protect women's rights. I think that came through loud and clear. We've got to improve Indigenous access to the rights and freedoms that our First Nations people actually deserve. It's their land. Yeah, um, yeah. So just look at that. And you say, are you really optimistic and promised about this? Because the well-being of the country is also reflected. If you look at the Trump America, which has just become us and them, or look in the UK, it's about ready to happen to Boris. Or you look at Russia, and there's one person who's maniacal in charge now, and the rest are his victims. Look at North Korea, won't even admit they had COVID. They're calling it a strange disease. Look, we are really fortunate. And Australia's health on Saturday showed me it's fine. We got to do better. We got to get more public housing, and we got to help our vulnerable. We got to protect age care and get universal early childhood. There's a lot of things politically we can do. Those would re reflect the values of a country that's trying to be healthy. Scandinavia often is touted as healthy and happy. People say the happiest place in the world in some of those countries, mostly because people don't worry about getting sick. They have free education. Mm -hmm. They know their kids will be okay because it's there's not a violent culture. Mm -hmm. I think we're heading in that direction. I feel much more promising about this. But I think for uni students, because they have so much on, we got to reflect that in taking some of that pressure off through seeking supports, but also in letting people say, remember, this is your choice. And mm. we're here to help you find that choice. Um, that aspect of things I know on the day to day as we get to an end of a semester is very tricky when people have four assessments due next week and they're going, oh my God, how am I going to do that? You're listening to Wellbeing a nationally distributed radio show and podcast. My guest today is Professor John Fischetti, where we are discussing student well-being in universities. How do universities foster good relational habits within students, like whether they be friendships or romantic relationships? How do they go about that? The students that actually do best in their marks also participate in activities. That could be a club, that could be what you're doing, that could be a sporting club, um, or they volunteer into student government. The students that do best get involved. And I know time is really precious. That's one of the ways is fostering building communities. Most of my colleagues met their partners when they went to university. So it's also life changing in the people you might live with, have babies with, or at least be the best mates for the rest of your mm -hmm. life will happen. So it's if you're not around enough for that to happen, yeah. you're going to end up missing out. And that's as true for mature age as it is for um, undergraduate school leavers. Some of that's building in 
to your day the chance to have physical space to be around. And our university has begun to improve that just in your short time here, Jack. I know you would say we now are beginning to have some spaces students between the tutorials could go and sit and have a meal or to meet and mingle or just sit without having to get in the car or run away. So we've got to make sure that university students embrace the whole experience and, and this concept that we developed that's actually part of our strategic plan about life ready. Most of that life ready isn't from the books or the exams. Mm. It's from the interactions with the people help leading you and your fellow classmates who are absolutely awesome. So in that sense, finding the time to build that in, put yourself out there, get involved. Those are the things that will last and are probably the same as what made high school successful students. They might not remember anything out of their algebra course, but they'll remember who they were sitting with in that course because those are the relationships you build that last a lifetime. We can't underestimate that and it's really hard to do it on Zoom. It seems as though university then, it's not just about the academic marks, but it's about also the relationships that we can form. It it is. And basically curriculum, which is a funny word we use, it's sort of what you're supposed to learn, right? It's the um, how you learn is called the pedagogy, but the curriculum I call relationships with a common agenda. So we might call it biology, but actually I'm going to take you on a journey inside the the content that we're supposed to learn, but you're going to explore what this field is and what you need to know about it together. So we're on a path together, that river cruise that I mentioned, Mm -hmm. as opposed to the two assessments, they're worth 50% each, it's going to be hard. Or one third of you won't succeed. So look, good luck with that. So I think it's about learning in a bigger sense than what's in the book um, or what's on the assessments. And it's also embracing change. The serendipity of learning is what I love. When you get up in the morning and go, I don't know what's going to happen today, but it could be good as opposed to, oh my goodness, I'm running late. I don't know. Maybe I just won't go. We got to go for it. And you're also accumulating a little bit of debt. So you might as well like get your money's worth too. <laughs> That's true. That's true. Well, it was a pleasure having you on the show today, John. And I thank you for taking the time. Jack, it's a pleasure as I get to know you. I'm inspired by your passion. And I think ultimately that's what things come back to is the passion people bring. You get your money double back when you when you reach it out, you get it back. And for our students to take advantage of that and find a couple people in the next week or two, just say, hey, let's have a cup of tea and talk about what it is you're interested in. And you never know, that could end up being a reference for your paper you were looking for or your next best friend or your roommate. My guest today was John Fischetti. Professor of Education from the University of Newcastle. Tune in next week where we discuss student well-being in high schools with a teacher from the UK. And if you like this content, check out the Wellbeing Podcast for more. Thank you for listening. I'm Jack Hodgins. And all of us are well-being. Wish you well.